I'm speaking with uh, Jerome Charon, which is a just a wonderful treat. I can't tell you how much I enjoy uh, reading Jerome Charon, and I I want to share this with you guys because I I know there, there's a, a lot of people who love uh, well, good storytelling in general, of course, and uh, it's particularly the subject of Jerome's latest novel, J.D. Salinger. There, there's so much of uh, intrigue and, and fascination about this this figure. So Jerome, I wanted to start with, with a broad question. What did you learn about J.D. Salinger from, from uh, creating your novel? Well, that's not the way I work, Henry. I, I did the research and um, he intrigued me. So you work out in your head prior to writing a word. I'm not so sure that I learned anything in writing it, the learning process occurs before the writing. In other words, the idea that I wanted to write about him means that in my head, I already had a map of what I wanted to do. That is to show the psychological damage that happened to him during the war, how it changed his life, turned him into the recluse that he was, and how those early stories were really the greatest war stories we have, even though you know the war doesn't appear in them. I mean, a perfect day for I mean, uh, for Esme with love and squalor is a wonderful war story when you go from the first instance of his being in Devon uh, with part of a counterintelligence group meeting that young girl. And then suddenly we move into a completely different landscape. And he's now Sergeant X. And we see he's been completely dislodged. So it's really the inspiration from, for the novel came from that story and from all the research that I did, you know, in terms of biographies, in terms of um, documentaries, et cetera, et cetera. But I think I knew, you, you know, you, you, I don't outline anything. The map is already inside my head. Well, I'm going to be coming at, I, I'm coming at it from a, just a general reader compared to yeah. you. I'm, I'm just like a, I'm just a student in, in your class. So I'm going to be asking whatever questions bravely, whatever you want. Well, I'm going to just, uh, no, I, I, there's no other way. I'm just going to stumble along and uh, I, I appreciate you, you're correcting me or however it. No, it, no, I'm not correcting you. I'm no, just I saying, I, I don't know how other writers write. I know that they plan and they instrumentalize. And uh, if you're a screenwriter, you, you put, you map the scenes on the board. And I also worked on, um, for television and we had to, you know, every, because it was commercial television, every, you had to have a beat every five minutes and you had to have a kind of high and a low and this and that. But when you're writing a novel, it's more like a musical composition. And even though you don't know where you're going to end and you don't know where you're going to begin, somehow it's still located inside your head, you know. Oh, I knew I was going to begin yeah. uh, at the store club and half the people love that opening and half the people hate it. And I, I don't understand, you know, I'm baffled because he did go to the store club, you know, with Una and I love the meeting, you know, with Winchell and Hemingway being there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, Finally, uh, you are your own reader. You um, have to be the master of what you do, whether you're right or you're wrong. And you could often be wrong. What you do can be completely wrong. But it seems to me that I loved that opening and I didn't care what the fuck anyone said. <laughs> well said. Well, I, It didn't make the slightest difference to me that people, for example, there's a French publisher who's interested in it and they want to take out that scene. And I said, 
why do you want to take out that scene? And they said, can you prove that Una and he were at the store club? Well, we sent them pictures. No, first they said, you know, first they didn't want them to take it out. So I show Lenore found a picture of Una at the store club. And it's definitely sure that Hemingway, I mean, that, that Salinger went with her to the store club, even though he didn't like it. And that Hemingway was in New York at the time. And he went to the store club all the time. So it, it seemed crazy to me, you know? So I, I had to react to it as well, this is the way you feel, this is the way I feel. I, unfortunately, I, you know, unfortunately the book becomes a product. It has to be published. The publisher has to make money. It has to sell books. And in your own mind, it's not a product. It's something that is more like, as I say, a musical composition with words or you're painting with words or whatever. And you're doing something that maybe no one will like or whatever, but you're still doing it because it satisfies you. And if it didn't satisfy you, the music wouldn't come. So it's difficult for me to see books as products, even though they have to be manufactured and they have to be printed, you know. And I can't bear, for example, the binding that they put in now, it's all plastic shit. So <laughs> I'm disenchanted with the way books look. Now. Well, uh, then you can certainly uh, uh, relate to J.D. Salinger's frustration with the conventions he had to uh, overcome I don't know if you got to see, because uh, I'm just a general person. I have to, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking movies and using those to help you uh, gain information quickly. Rebel no. in, the, in the Rye, I don't know if you saw that one. I, I think you'd enjoy it. It's, it's a uh, fun I movie. thought it was a terrible. It, it's very was, light. It's the film, it's the fiction film. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. I thought, first of all, he didn't look like Hemingway at all. <laughs> I mean, he didn't look like Salinger at all. And I, I thought it was that I'm, I'm not trying to contradict you, Henry. I'm just giving you my point of view. I didn't think that was Salinger that we saw on the screen. No, but I, 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 I what I I'm going to do is show you the cover of the British edition. Okay. Where his face looks haunted. He was a haunted man. He was a ghost. You could see it in his eyes. You know, um, he was haunted from the day he returned to the day he died. You know, he went through the war from Normandy all the way to the worst campaigns to the freeing of the concentra concentration camp, to having a nervous breakdown, to marrying a woman who was really um, a German uh, agent. Here's the here's the British edition. Okay. okay. Can you move it back just a tiny bit? You see his eyes? Yeah. That's the Salinger that I see. You know. Um. He was a haunted man, a haunted house. And that's the person I wanted to write about. Well, I uh, am just going to stumble along and then let you take center stage. Sure. That's the best way to do it. I I do agree with you that Rebel in a Rye is a light movie, but it helped just to give me a little bit of a sense of the of certain things, like the New Yorker's reaction to his work. And uh, so I, I, I can fill in the blanks as best I can. but. Uh, and I'm going to jump around a little bit. Sure. I don't know. This is another light question, but it's interesting to the general public. I just stumbled upon this fact. Maybe you're aware of it, but there is a movie that was made of a J.D. Salinger short story. Yes, it was. It was My Foolish Heart. And it was with, um, what's her name? Uh, uh, Susan. Uh, Susan, Susan Hayward. Hayward. Yeah. No. And he hated it. And he wouldn't allow any of his work, uh, 
even though Kazan came and I think knocked on his door and everyone wanted to do a film of Catcher in the Rye for which he could have earned an enormous amount. What, what I like best about him is his crazy integrity, you know. Um, he earned a great deal from the books that were published all over the world. They had reception in today's world. We would say it's a white world. Uh, it's a narrow world. Um, it's of a different time. But um, I think for someone like me, growing up in New York, those stories give you an image of New York in, in the 40s and early 50s that no other writer has been able to do. He's caught the magic of the time and the dialogue in the location in the poetry, you know. No other writer has been able, some people might say Cheever, but Cheever wasn't really from Manhattan, even though he lived there, I mean, for a certain part of his life. Um, I, I think that um, he captured a landscape uh, and also because he didn't know what, what he was. Here's a guy who's bar mitzvahed and then three months later, his father tells him that he's not Jewish. <laughs> well, what the fuck is going on? I was rereading uh, passages from the book last night, and, and, and that comes towards the end. I, I love how yeah. you, you, you go back to, to certain points in his life to, to emphasize what, it, what was it that made J.D. Salinger J.D. Salinger? And, and right, well, we'll, we'll, never, we'll, we'll never know, and I'm not even sure I, I asked that question. I just want to, to write a book about a haunted house. Yes, I get it. That's it. Well, you, yes, you have this, this beautiful subject, and then as like a painter, you use your tools and you create something from that subject. Yeah, and, and uh, people wanted me to take out the scene in Bloomingdale's, and I said, that's the best fucking scene in the goddamn book. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> There's some uh, there, uh, people out there. Please, you, you, uh, if you don't know about this book, you've got to read it. And there's so many beautiful flourishes. And there's a, a, a one on page two forty nine to two fifty, where, where you go in there and you do your own beautiful magic of uh, of your love for New York. And I think he's going to. Is it Belvedere Castle? Is this the castle? And yeah. He, and then he turns into a little boy, and then yeah. he's there with Doris, and then there's Sylvia, who's a who's yeah. a witch, and that chilling line. Uh, uh, she said, well, uh, "Doris says, what can you teach me?" And then she says, "How not to exist." Yeah. It's so chilling. Yeah. It is so well, chilling. Well, it's meant. It's meant to be, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It did. It did its job. It, it did. It did. Um, let me see if I can do a little bit of wizardry. I'm going to go into share screen mode. I don't know if this is going to work, but I think it will. Okay. Oh, wow. That was quick. Yeah. So, right. so now we can do a little bit of uh, have a history lesson for folks. I felt I needed it to, to keep track of, of all the places, all the, all the events going on in Salinger's yeah. life during World War II. And the Slapton Sands is very significant. Do yeah, most people that? don't know about it. That that's what's so interesting. It's it's been hidden from history that um, we had this uh, pre-invasion plan that was a complete disaster. You know. Yeah. And it had it had to be hidden because uh, it would have ruined the invasion chances. But. Um, it's a terrifying story. The people were moved out of their homes. Um, we had this mock invasion. Suddenly, these German submarines appear and start shelling our ships. And um, Salinger's caught in the shit, you know. And he never talks about it. You see, some people say, well, I mean, the myth is that He's been, he wrote for the last 40 years of his life and one of the novels he wrote was about his own war experiences. Somehow I don't believe it, you know, maybe it is true. Maybe, you know, there are these hidden masterpieces, but if you look at his last published work, 
uh, which is about, um, you know, Seymour as a kid of seven years old at a camp. It's unreadable. It's just gibberish, you know. Um, and I think his work became so convoluted, so interior. You know, it was such an interior landscape that you'd have to say his final communication was between him and his many selves, which is fine, which is maybe the way a writer would work. You could say Melville worked the same way in Moby Dick, but somehow what he was able to uncover was a landscape that, again, not recognized in its own time. It was a complete failure. But maybe the most profound work of the 19th century and, a, you know, prefigures 20th century capitalism and the whole explosion, the whole sense of exploitation. So, you know, you have to locate a text within time. And when it's not its right time, it has little meaning, you know. But we still don't know. If someone, did you know about Slapton Sands? No. No, I, I, Nobody I thought knows it. about it. Well, I figured that was something you were compelled to include in your novel. Well, I felt compelled to include it because I didn't know anything about it. And none of us would have known anything about it except one man, an Englishman, was walking on the beach and suddenly he starts digging and he, he finds a tank. He says, what the fuck is a tank doing on this beach? And he spends the rest of his life trying to get the story told. His wife leaves him, his children hate, hate him. But finally he gets the United States military to reveal what happened at Slapton Sands. It's a terrifying tale. It's a novel even I couldn't have written. It, it's a novel in itself. And it's a true story, you know. Well, let me move on to D-Day. Yeah. And I, I, I found this very useful. I, I'm an ignoramus. I, I, of course, I've heard of Omaha Beach. I never really heard of Gold, Juno, and, and Sword. I, I'm not a World War II buff, but I guess well, I didn't hear of Gold and Juno either. I only heard of Omaha and Utah. Remember, let's see, in 1944, I was seven years old. So everyone knew Omaha Beach, and some people knew Utah. And it's still not clear when um, Salinger landed. He landed at Utah um, in the second sort of task force, but his company supposedly landed in the fourth, you know. So it's not even clear when he did land. Nothing is clear. We know the only thing that's clear is that he landed at Utah Beach. Well, if somebody's looking at a map of, of, of England and France, the English Channel, there's only so many places you can land. So the Nazis Hey, it's a pretty good bet they're, they're going to land in Utah or whatever it was called for the Germans. And God, it's just so devious. Uh, I, I, I'm a loss for words with the razor wire. The, 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 uh, yeah. the, 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 no, there's also the another place where they thought they were going to land. I think in Calais. I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have, to, I'd, ha I'd have to look at my sources. There were two possible places. But you know, Henry, it, it one thing is clear that um, the Germans would have stopped us if they had had, remember, half of their forces were being used as guards in concentration camps. Yeah. And these six million Jews who died for nothing really helped us win the war because if, the Germans could have maintained both of these stations if they'd had the troops, but half their troops were in these concentration camps. It's completely crazy. It was an insanity, an insanity. And um, here you have the, well, we know, we know about 
Utah and Omaha because these were the beaches where the Americans landed. The British probably know more about gold and the French, um, I don't know if that was the, the British and the free French landed at-, uh, at Or Can Canadian? No, Canadians, the Canadians, I'm sorry, yeah. And the free French were with us, you know. So, uh, and also, who is going to enter Paris first, the, the French or the Americans, you know? So it's completely crazy. So now we move on to the, the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah. And God, this looks very serious shit. What would you yeah, like to say? Yeah, we, we all thought that uh, Hitler was not going to make a last stand. And uh, I would compare this to what happened in, in, in the Capitol on June 6th. It was like a last stand. Um, so suddenly Hitler went from being on the defensive to going to make his final offensive plan. And it didn't work. It couldn't have worked, but it worked for a little while, you know. This was his last stand. And once the Battle of the Bulge ended, it was a complete German retreat. Now, I picked up somewhere on the internet that uh, J.D. Salinger is considered the American who saw, witnessed most combat in World War II, or it was in, in more different places, the D-Day, the Battle of the Bulge, the first Nazi. Uh, no, there were others who went through the same you know, situation as he did. But you have to remember that it was much more complicated for him because he was both a rifleman and a member of counter, the counterintelligence corps. Now as a member of the counterintelligence corps, he could order generals around. He had priority over quarters. He had, you know, so he wore sort of two masks, both as a fighting soldier and as a, uh, you know, an interrogator. So it was really a very strange situation for him. Now, I, I'm not clear, how did he end up getting such a, a high position, relatively high position in everything? No, it, it wasn't a high position. He was only a corporal. Well, I, I mean, one that gave him so much access and, and allowed him to be in certain places and certain authority, all of that. Well, that's because he was a member, you know, intelligence, you know, has its own sort of, uh, you know, utility. It has its own sort of power. And um, as I say, he was both a rifleman and a member of counterintelligence. He was attached to a unit and also was an interrogator. So he had, a, and also he was able to write during this whole time. There's a photograph of him, I think, with his typewriter. Yeah, um, I, I think his, his writing being such a strong suit, that, that meant quite a lot. I, I, I assume he, he was relatively a poor student or not a, somebody who applied himself, but I guess he applied himself when he, when he wanted to. I don't know about what kind of student he was, but certainly uh, he was a reader. He studied writing at Columbia. And I think the war changed him forever, made him into a great writer and a recluse at the same time, but uh, also turned him totally inward. So by the end, the stories of the Glass family are almost the stories of his private children. You know, it's a kind of private juggle. Whereas the early stories are incredibly powerful. You know, I'm not a great fan of the Glass family. Well, except what, for a perfect day for banana fish and Seymour Glass, you know. Yeah, and in one of our conversations, you said you weren't necessarily a a great fan of, of Catcher and the Rye. It, it was no. the, short, the short stories okay. are, are what you love. 
Yeah, I think they have a music. I, I think uh, Catcher in the Rye is a very mannered book, but evidently it caught the tone for a certain generation, a sense of rebellion. Uh, and it's really, when you think about it, it's a young adult novel. Um, and it's young adults, probably mostly males. I don't know how many women re read it. I think mostly males. And I think it still sells an enormous number of copies each year, though it's shrinking, it's diminishing, which is one reason why they put it in audio book. Well, I remember being quite taken with it uh, as a young person reading it. I, w I was, I just thought this is so refreshing and I, I loved it. Uh, but rereading it, it does seem to be slower than I thought it was, than I remembered it. I, I kind of remember it as being better than what it was in some ways. Well, it probably was better at the time you read it because remember the times change, the world changes. And this is not the world of Holden Caulfield anymore. So um, I don't know, it, it, was, it was a book that sort of unified a certain readership and, uh, but I never liked it, you know, I never, I never was a fan, but I, I was an incredible fan of the nine stories. I thought they were magical to me. Yeah, I was uh, looking over the nine stories and I, there is a, a, a lightness and crispness. Uh, I mean, the, the banana fish story is, is just so beautiful. Except it, for the suicide, you know, when yeah, you read it's it the weird. Time, it works, but it doesn't work after that. I think it was a mistake. Maybe he needed it as part of his mythology because he could kill himself with a pencil you know, but didn't, didn't really have to commit suicide. And it's interesting, the very next story, Uncle Wiggily in Connecticut, is, uh, it just blows me away. And that is the story that was turned into My Foolish Heart. Yes. Which yeah. I don't understand at all, because watching the trailer, My Foolish Heart looks like a constipated uh, B movie. It just, there, I don't see any connection with that. No, there is no connection, but you know, they, they buy the material and then they destroy it. That's yeah. the way they do it. Yeah. Let me move on to the liberation of the concentration camps. And this is very, very hard to look at. I remember as a young person in the 80s, a, a friend telling me, well, how many concentration camps do you know? Oh, you know Auschwitz, but do you know the other ones? Do you, and, it wasn't like a game, but it kind of was a little bit of a game for him. Said, so, "Well, I, I and I, I knew the the well known ones, but God, there's so many others here. I, I don't oh, think everywhere. And look, there were at least elite troops at every one of these camps. Elite troops, yeah, who weren't deployed, you know, were were you know were killers and soldiers." And um, you have Buchenwald, you have Bergen Belsen, but look, look how many others there are. Um, it's some are it, it's incredible. And he, I believe, was in Dachau. Yeah. Most are concentration camps, some are death camps. Uh, Auschwitz began as a concentration camp and upgraded to a death camp. That is just so disgusting. Well, we have to remember the concentration camps occurred earlier when they, before they had the plan of murdering these people. This was a means of getting them out of the way. And it only started, I think, in 41 or 42. I don't remember the exact time. But it was an insane idea. And, and it still persists. I mean, even in the attack on the Capitol, you, you saw um, people with sweatshirts um, about Hitler, about the concentration camps, about the six million, you know, it, 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 it's, it's mind boggling that these insignias should still persist with us. This terrifying situation should become a chant, a chant of war that was terrifying and so distressing to me. 
Well, let's get out of there. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there something that uh, you think the general public, especially young people, should know about World War II? Or I think if you're curious and you want to know, you find out. Or well, I think it was um, a heroic war for the United States. Um, we became um, uh, I'm not even going to say the most powerful. We, we were able, we won the war because we could outproduce the Germans. I mean, all, I mean, the anti Semite Ford turned his plant into uh, a maker of planes and, and tanks. Um, and we converted civilian enterprises into war machines. And somehow, Today, we have to do the same thing. We have to turn these companies into vaccine producers. We have to mobilize, you know. We should be able to provide vaccines for the entire planet. And, um, and I think in this year, probably we will move closer to doing that. You know, we lost four years. Um, I, I just think of it as being snow blinded for four years, four five years maybe. I don't know. I don't really know. And let's hope it doesn't come back. You know. Um, but um, the World War. I mean, we 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 brought back Europe with the Marshall Plan. Um, the Cold War started even before World War II ended. We could have taken Berlin. If we had taken Berlin, it's, um, it's Roosevelt who allowed the Russians to take Berlin. If we had taken Berlin, there would have been no East Germany. So you see, um, we made terrible mistakes too. And what Patton wanted to do is go right from Germany he wanted to invade Russia. And at some point, as crazy as it was, maybe it wasn't such a bad idea. I don't know. You know, I, it was a bad idea, but I'm just saying in his mind, he had tanks and he had to keep moving. You, know? <laughs> you see, as a child growing up during the war, it's the central event in my fictive life, you know. That's why writing about World War II in, in Salinger was not a difficult task because it was reliving what I remembered, but as a child, you know, worrying that the Nazis would appear, worrying about the atomic bomb, um, history is a, is a very strange kiss that lands um, in a way that uh, invigorates you and, and destroys you, you know. Uh, you're destroyed by your past and yet you, it enlarges you at the same time. So it's, it's very, you know, people I know Lenore is a great reader of science fiction, but I, I am not. The future, you know, doesn't hold the same appeal to me. It's the past. It's the past that I try to uh, summon up, you know, in my own way. And, and as far as meaning is concerned, I don't know what the meaning is. I know what the music is. And that the music becomes the meaning to me. So I'm not a philosopher. You know. But um, I was very happy to be able to write this book. Because when I was a kid going to high school, 
everybody talked about Salinger. It was in the 50s. This was, you know, he was in vogue at that time. I'd never heard of him, you know. And the, the parents of some of the students knew him, knew Salinger. They said I looked like him because I had very big ears, you know. <laughs> we had the same we had the same first name, you know. It's interesting. Growing up for me, my J.D. Salinger experience was seeing all of these novels come up and being praised as the next Catcher in the Rye. This generation's Catcher in the Rye. And I think uh, Goodbye Columbus, maybe, uh, I don't know that it really makes sense to call it the next Catcher in the Rye, but. No, there is no, there is no next Catcher in the Rye. I mean, it was uh, a book about a particular time uh, about a young boy's, a young man's rebellion. Uh, I would have liked it better if the language had not been so mannered, but you know, I, I'm in the minority. Most people love it. Well, sometimes a, a novel, well, a novel is a novel. It can take some slow, slow turns and then resol the resolution grabs you. So I think the resolution of Catcher in the Rye is what people love that he gets to hold on to his uh, pursuit to, to preserve innocence. Yeah, maybe, I, I, I don't know, just say I'm not a fan of the book, so. I understand, but I think that, uh, well, who am I to say this, but I'm, I'm a reader and I, what I love about uh, uh, this book, Sergeant Salinger is that, I. I love how it's bookended by the, the, the Walter Winchell stuff and then the uh, yeah. after he comes back from World War II. And uh, so you get a taste of New York post-World War II and in, in between is the World War, World War II combat um, yeah. content, which is the meat of the book. But at the same time, Una dovetails in and uh, the war dovetails in to, when he's back in Bloomingdale's and all of that. It's just beautiful how everything dovetails in. And uh, I love the, the Walter Winchell stuff. Do you want to say just a little bit about Walter Winchell? Because he's like a very curious figure from a- He was a complete prick, but he was <laughs> uh, very, very powerful. I mean, he could destroy your reputation. He was, you know, I think he wrote for the mirror, though I'm not, I don't remember anymore, but he also was on the radio. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea. You know, everybody listened to him. He was in films. He was a hoofer, you know, he danced. Uh, he was a son of a bitch. But he was very, very, and also he was an admiral in the reserves. Um, he did a great deal of harm <laughs> and maybe a little bit of good, but I doubt it. <laughs> Well, he was. Uh, there's a film called The Sweet Smell of Success. I don't know if you've seen it. With with um, you should watch it with with Burt Lancaster. Yeah, I, I think I might have seen that when I was uh, a kid. I don't remember. Yeah, but that's that's Winchell. Okay. Yeah. So just watch the film again. Yeah, he's in league with Luella Parsons, Hedda Hopper, yeah. that that type. Yeah. Well. This has been a treat, and I, I think we, I hope I've done justice in presenting the book to the general public and do, doing my little sure. part. <laughs> but sure. it's, this has been delightful, and I, I've enjoyed having dinner with you and with Lenore, and just quite a treat. I hope we can do it again sometime. Sure, sure. I mean, we <laughs> stay well. Thank you so much. So I'll, I'll end it there.